Let's start with the strange and slowly work our way towards the most horrifying things on the list. Number 10. The Four Thieves Vinegar So legend has it that a group of four thieves would loot and ransack the homes of people who had recently died from the plague. They would go on to steal from dozens of victims without any of them ever getting sick. They stayed safe by rubbing a secret potion over their entire bodies. But eventually, these thieves would be caught and apprehended by the authorities. They were then offered their freedom in exchange for the recipe of this secret potion, which they revealed to be a mixture of vinegar, garlic, herbs, and spices. No one knows for certain if this story is true, but this was a very popular tale during this time period. This would lead merchants to go door to door selling this vinegar mixture as a preventative for the plague. Buyers were instructed to rub this potion on their hands, ears, and temple. But if the merchant had them hook, line, and sinker, he would simply just tell them to lather it over their entire bodies. Since everyone knows, the number one rule in sales is always upsell when you can. And surprisingly, this potion would work really well against the bubonic plague, thanks to the mixture containing the herb mugwort, which is a natural bug repellent. And since the bubonic plague was spread from the fleas of infected rodents, this would prove to be one of the very few remedies that actually worked. But sadly, fleas were not the only way of contracting the Black Plague, the second method being much more deadly and was most commonly spread from human to human. This would be known as the pneumonic plague, which often carried a 100% mortality rate. This form usually spreads when a person inhales the airborne droplets of an infected person, <coughs> which caused the disease to infect the lungs. And of course, the potion would prove to be completely useless against this form of infection. Number 9. Quack Doctors Throughout history, when the Black Plague would break out, those with financial means would flee from cities and escape to the countryside. This would of course include the majority of the city's doctors, leaving behind a massive and lucrative market for quacks, where they would post up on city corners selling powders, potions, magical cures, and anything else that they could think of. They would yell at the top of their lungs at people walking by, letting them know that they were selling the latest and greatest cures or preventatives for the plague or any other ailments. Are you in search for the best preventative for the plague? Then you need to be eating unicorn horn powder. What the hell are you doing? Have a stomach ache? Oh, oh, that's the first sign of the plague. So drink this fermented potion. Tastes terrible? Shut up and drink it. Don't you want to feel better? Of course you do. Feeling ill? Eat a baby foot. Have a headache? Place this magical stone under your bed. Sniff the squirrel hide. Cover yourself in salmon oil and jump into your neighbor's bath. You will be feeling better by tomorrow. But if for some reason, by some miracle, my 100% guaranteed remedy doesn't work, come back for a full refund after 10 days of your initial first symptoms. Now, here's a list of some of the most common items that a quack doctor would sell throughout history, just so you can get an idea of how scummy these guys really were. <clears throat> Snake oil, of course. Chill and fever tonic. Miracle elixirs that cured pretty much everything. Ointments that would cure baldness. But my favorite one, a tincture that would restore life in the event of sudden death. <laughs> And since these quacks sold whatever they wanted, we can only assume that there's probably hundreds of other items that were never documented. Number 8. Urine Back during the medieval period, urine had a great reputation since it was thought to have cleansing and healing properties. So naturally, it would be used as a form of treatment for the plague. Finally, a remedy I can afford. Anyone infected with the disease was encouraged to take a bath with clean urine to relieve some of their painful symptoms. The urine would be collected from healthy people and sold to the sick, where it was then added to their bath water, or better yet, consumed directly from the glass. But if I was alive during this time period, I for one could never bring myself to partake in such a disgusting and humiliating practice. Buying from a middleman. Since I always say drinks are at their best straight from the faucet. Number 7. Miasma Theory One of the most popular theories at this time was that the plague was contracted by inhaling bad air, or simply put, bad odors. The long list of these bad smells included organic and human waste, decaying flesh, contaminated water, and of course, the Dutch oven, which was a guaranteed way to be put on trial for attempted murder. 
Bad smells were believed to carry contaminated air, which once inhaled would lead to illness. The public was encouraged to carry around flowers, rose petals, or herbs, which they would oftentimes hold to their nostrils, since they believed that the sweet smell would cancel out the bad air. This is one of the reasons plague doctors would wear these terrifying masks, since the beak would be filled with flowers and spices, which they believed helped keep the disease at bay. But of course, these wonderful smells did absolutely nothing in preventing people from catching the plague. If anything, it just gave people a false sense of security. Number 6. Leeches Leeches were commonly used by the wealthy as a form of bloodletting, and was relatively painless considering what the alternative was, but more on that one later. Bloodletting is when blood is drained from a patient, usually from an incision or leeches. Here the leeches would be placed on a person's body, while they kick back, relax, and let the leeches go to town. The theory behind this was that the leeches would suck out the bad blood, which was thought to cause illness. But the irony being that the leech's bite was the thing that could make them ill, since it always carried the chance of developing an infection. Now, originally, I didn't think this whole leech operation sounded too bad, until I saw the diagram for the most common locations for bloodletting. Number 5. The Vickery Method the Vickery method was named after Thomas Vickery, the English doctor who invented the technique, and this would become one of the most popular cures during the plague. This first begins with a healthy chicken having its bottom plucked clean. The chicken's back door is then placed directly on a sick person's buboes and strapped down to keep it in place. The logic behind this was based on the belief that chickens breathe through their back door, so in theory it would suck out and absorb the sickness from the person. And if the chicken contracts the plague from the human and begins to show signs of illness, people would oftentimes take this as a sign that the remedy was working. If the chicken happens to die before the human, another chicken simply takes its place. Now, I can only speculate since there isn't much written on the subject, but this seems like a sure way to get an infection. You see, buboes would oftentimes grow so large that they would rupture, and a chicken's bottom attached to an open wound just seems like the best way to get your admission ticket to the afterlife. Number 4. Flagellation in Europe, during the medieval period, religion was deeply ingrained into all aspects of life. So naturally, people began to believe that the Black Plague was simply a punishment from God for their sins. Soon, groups of people began to gather and walk the streets while vigorously whipping themselves as a public display of repentance. While I, for one, prefer to keep this kink at home. But to each their own. These groups of people would use leather whips with knotted tails, but some show-offs would take it a step further by adding nails to their whips. These flagellant groups would recruit others when they would slowly walk from town to town, whipping their own backs and carrying crosses. They would do this act multiple times a day. But the real tragedy would come when one of these individuals would be infected with the plague, since they were left to fight an uphill battle with an already deadly disease. And having a weak body that was severely cut up from the self-inflicted wounds definitely didn't help. Number 3. Feces as time went on, physicians began to try all sorts of bizarre methods in the hopes of finding a cure, with this special paste being one of them. The paste consisted of tree resin, flower roots, and human poop. This operation would first begin with the patient's buboes getting sliced open, and as soon as the incision was made, it would then be stuffed with the paste, then tightly wrapped and sealed to hold everything in place. Patients would then be instructed to get some bed rest and wait. Now, if the patient's body part had not fallen off by the following morning, they would for sure be left fighting a losing battle, since it had now turned into a 2v1 with the person fighting against the plague and the infection. Number 2. Bloodletting This was an extremely popular medical procedure that was used from ancient times all the way through the late 19th century. This procedure was in fact so popular that during the medieval period, this would oftentimes be the first thing a doctor would recommend. This absolute nightmare would first start with a person getting their arm sliced open and allowing the blood to drain into a bowl. Now, if a cut on the arm made you uncomfortable, don't worry, since you always have the option to have the incision made on your neck instead. Now, the instruments that were used to slice patients open look like this, but just covered in blood from the previous patient. Since being sanitary wasn't much of a concern during this time period, which of course would cause many patients to die from infection. 
But one of the most concerning things about this procedure was the amount of blood that would be drained, since it was common practice to increase the amount drained based on the severity of the person's sickness. Have a headache? That's 2 teaspoons. A fever? That's 16 ounces. A crippling social anxiety that prevents you from enjoying social gatherings? Yup, that one is about a gallon. Now, surprisingly, doctors were not usually the person to perform bloodletting and was actually a task left for barbers, since they were a lot more skilled in handling razors. This is the reason why they began to place the red stripe on the barber pole outside of the building, since it would let the public know that surgery was performed inside. Barbers would also pull teeth, amputate limbs, and make holes in people's heads. Number 1. Extermination now this would easily be the most extreme measure taken during the medieval period in the attempt to stop the plague. One of the groups that was heavily targeted were the Jewish. This would first start when the rumors began to circulate that the Jews had intentionally poisoned the drinking wells. So on September of 1348, a group of Jews would be taken as prisoners to Chillin Castle on Lake Geneva. There, they were brutally tortured until one of them would finally confess to poisoning the drinking water. Which of course, was not true. The information of this confession was then sent to various cities in Germany, and once the news arrived, it began to spread like wildfire throughout many countries in Europe. And thousands of Jews would then be targeted and murdered for this false confession. It was even documented that Jews from the age of 7 and up were all considered guilty for this crime, since the belief was that they all had previous knowledge of this plan. Even though the Jewish community was clearly suffering as they themselves were being decimated by the plague, but this wouldn't seem to matter to the general public and the killings would tragically continue. And it wouldn't be until the spread of the plague began to slow down that the murders would too. Mm -hmm. 